Praise God, saints. This is Apostle William Kevin Britt from First Century Christ Church International Divinity College. And we have with us also Pastor Trina Houston from Greater Grace Ministries. She's working the panel today. Normally, we would also have Apostle Ernest Jones III, but uh, he had a, a loss in the family, and he is contending with that right now. Praise God. We'll keep him up in prayer. Praise God. Monitoring the chat, we have Apostle Jennifer Britt who is going to be manning the chat. If you make comments now, saints, if you're viewing this on my personal page, William Kevin Britt, or you're viewing this on uh, a first century Christ church media, those comments are not going to be monitored live. However, if you jump over to first century Christ church international page, then if you make comments on the chat, those comments will be responded to live. So this is a divinity college, a free divinity college in which you can get a degree, four-year degree, bachelor's degree in divinity. And you don't have to pay a dime. You just have to buy your own books. Praise the Lord. There's Apostle Jennifer just throwing out those blessings to everybody. A lot of the saints also see it on recording. Understand that if you comment from the recording, we will respond to those comments as well. Whatever notifications we get in the comment section, we will respond to them even if it's a recording. Praise God. Um, the books we use, obviously the Bible, okay, is the principal book. Then we also use Training for Service. That's our student workbook. And we also use another book called Through the Bible in a Year. All you have to do is send an email to First Century Christ Church International, F-C-C-C-I, F-C-C-C-I, okay, three C's, dot D-C, amen, amen. And uh, just say, enroll me, and you're immediately enrolled in the Bible College. Praise God. He will send you all the information you need to do, everything you need to do to connect with it. Praise God. Blessings. Evangelist Dumas is with us here. Praise God. Let's open up with a word of prayer now that we have a quarrel. Father Lord, in the name of your son, Christ Yeshua, and by your grace and by your mercy, we ask, my God, that you bless this time of fellowship, Lord, that you cleanse our heart of every impurity, Father God. Give us a good conscience, a pure heart, and a sincere faith with our goal to be to love the souls, my God, the same way Christ loved them, the same way he came and he died for them, that they might have hope. And so we work diligently and we search our hearts eagerly for everything that would interfere with the true love of Christ being manifested through us. We pray you bless this time that we do these segments, Lord, and that you bless the college and that you bless the students in the college, that this is a place where where academic wisdom meets practical application. We pray, Father God, for these things in Yeshua's mighty name. And the body of Christ says, can we get an amen in the house amen. of God? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay, so saints, what's going to happen is um, I'm going to do a review since we don't have Apostle Ernest on the panel. We've got Apostle Jen monitoring the chat up. Uh, Pastor Pastor uh, Trina Houston from Great Grace is going to have a huge amount of time to cover the material. I'm going to do a review and then I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Trina. So uh, praise God. One second. Praise God. So saints, the first review we're going to do is going to be in training for service. I like using the review in this book. And so think about think about this institute year because that's what this is. Five semesters. The, uh, at the end of the fifth semester, you'll receive a diploma for Bible Institute. You'll have gone through the entire Bible in one year. OK, this is lesson number four. And so the primary focus is lessons number 15 and 17 through through the Bible in a year. I'm sorry. OK, and then training for service lesson 11. And saints, this has been an exciting ride. It's been an exciting time. And uh, some people are academics. They, they look for academics. And if you're just looking for academics, you're absolutely in the wrong place. We're not going to help you with that because um, knowledge without love, knowledge without grace is has no love. And we're not, look to, we're not looking to create monsters in the body of Christ. We believe there's quite enough monsters already in the body of Christ. We don't need to help create any additional monsters. Praise God. We're here for discipleship. So part of us going through the Bible is actually in discipleship. So look at this, this, this uh, first year, this institute level year. Look at it as broken up into fundamentally um, three parts. So one part is a real cross overview. That's the training for service. Another part is an overview. That's through the Bible in a year. So it's like a survey, right? 
And then the other part is a detailed going through of the Torah, which is why if you look at the title, you'll see that it, it says that the title is Statute, and it's going to cover some Torah segments. Okay, so we actually read the Torah portions that would be read in the Jewish synagogues today. Well, not this day per se, but this week's Torah portions. And we give those, we, we go through those portions in a little bit more detail, and then we do an overview of the rest of the word. And so that's why we're going to start first with the overview. Then we're going to go from the overview to a little bit more detailed overview. And then Pastor Trina is going to go through whatever segments of the Torah that we're in with a little bit more detail. Amen. The goal being for it to affect your soul, for you to learn the discipleship lessons that have been placed there. So um, in training for service in lesson number one, um, it starts talking about the Bible as a whole, abide the Bible as a whole. Okay, so for those of you with the book on page 11, how we got the Bible. So it starts talking about the origin of the Bible, starts talking about the number of people that wrote the Bible, over how many years it was written. And it's a, it's a miracle that this piece of work written by many authors over many years has a common theme, a consistent theme, one theme that goes across the entire time period, and that one theme works together towards one objective and one goal. So that in of itself uh, it imposes a belief in the divine nature of the book. And it talks about the different translations and the different versions. I personally have studied over six different translations of the Bible, and I haven't really seen a significant difference in any one of the six different uh, translations of the Bible. So um, there are differences, but not significant enough that I would say it was a salvation issue. Now, mind you, to come with new translations every day. Who knows? You have to do your own research there if you feel like you, you, you need to uh, determine whether the Bible translation you're using is 100% accurate. And then we acknowledge that it's God's word to us. That's lesson two. So God is giving us his word and his word is going to be impregnated into us so that we can learn and know and have a track back to the Lord. And then it talks in lesson three, the divisions of the Bible. So the Bible appears to have different types of books. One, one way of breaking it down is to say Old Testament, New Testament. Usually it's generally considered that the Hebrew scriptures are part of the Old Testament and the apostolic scriptures or the Christian Greek scriptures are part of the New Testament. But the reality is God never used the term Old or New Testament. That's an observation of men. God treats the work as one collection of books fulfilling Genesis chapter 315. So when we start breaking up the divisions, of course, the Torah is considered the books of the law. Then there are books that just basically are historical. Then we have books that are poetic. And then we have books that are prophecies. And this is this comprises what we would consider to be the Old Testament. The New Testament appears to be broken up into gospels and then also history and then other letters and then a final book of prophecy. Okay. Lesson four talks about the books of the law and talks about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You've seen me talk about this so many times. You guys should be able to follow along. So Genesis is the story of the beginning up to the time that they go to Egypt. They go in Egypt. And God promises them that they're not going to stay there. They're going to be per they're persecuted for 400 years, but God's going to punish the nation that persecutes them and give them a release. That's Exodus. When God takes them out, then he then wants to uh, teach them his ways. He creates his ketuvah, his, his, his contract, his marital contract, the agreement that was going to exist between him and his bride, the nation of Israel and Yahweh. And so that's the book of Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Then uh, there's sort of a census taken. And of course, they kind of don't get to go into the promised land. So as a result of not getting to go in the promised land because of disobedience, God then saying he's taking their children into the promised land. So in the book of Numbers, you're going to find a census in there. You're going to find the counting or the living of the 40 years of wandering the desert. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. OK, and then after numbers, we have Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is the giving of the law again, because now the adults who heard the law in Leviticus are now gone and their children are now adults and they now have to affirm their place before the law. So God gives them the law again. It gives them the ketubah or the marital agreement in the book of Deuteronomy. And there you have your first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
Know the story, you'll know the books. Know the books, you'll know the story. They work hand in hand. Amen. And so it also then also talks in, in lesson number four about the books of history. Joshua, Judges, Ruth talk about the history before the crown. First and second Samuel discusses the crown of King Saul and the crown of King David. First and second Kings chronicalizes the king's reign and first and second Chronicles chronicalizes the temple, the history of the temple. Okay. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Esther saved uh, the nation of Israel from genocide. Okay. Nehemiah was the governor to rebuild the wall and Ezra was the priest to rebuild the temple, books of history, books of prophecy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. We're going to go into those more in the last semester. The last semester is going to be a blowout. You guys think this was exciting. Wait till you get to the last semester. It's going to be a complete blowout because we're going to start going through the prophets. Amen. Minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Haggai. Uh, Zechariah and Malachi. A lot of people don't realize they think these prophets all like it was one prophet per season, but some of these prophets are contemporaries of each other. One is preaching to the northern kingdom, the other one's preaching to the southern kingdom. So it'd be interesting to see how the books of history and the books of prophecy intertwine so that we can understand the pol politics more of a three, four dimensional view of what was going on in, in Jerusalem and in Judaism during what we call the Old Testament. The books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, praise God. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, these are basically the Gospels. The idea is these Gospels were written to different groups. So Matthew was written primarily to the Jews who understood genealogies and historical family lines and prophecy. So Matthew focuses a lot on the genealogy of Jesus, the man, son of man. Uh, why? Because the Jews would know about these things. He wouldn't write that to the Greeks. The Greeks could care less who he's the son of, and the son of, and the son of, because none of those prophecies were given to them. So Matthew has clearly been written to the Jewish population, and Mark also was written to a specific population amongst the people. Luke was written primarily uh, for the for, to the Greeks. The Greeks are, have a certain literary style. Okay. And uh, he appealed to them. And then John's writings were basically to fill in what wasn't in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It was the last of the Gospels. And then, of course, we have the letters. The Pauline letters represent letters to churches. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and the book of Hebrews, which they attribute to Paul. But there is no official statement at who the author of Hebrews is. It is presumed to be Paul, and they presume Paul didn't put his name on it because there was still people amongst the Christian Jews who questioned the authenticity of Paul's conversion. So I think Paul's name was hidden from the book for that specific purpose, but there's no proof that Paul wrote Hebrews, and some people argue that he did not. And then, of course, outside of the Pauline letters, we have the letter from James, first and second Peter, first, second, the third of John, and Jude, and then a one book of prophecy in the New Testament, the book of Revelations. Now, it's a great picture on pages 30 and 31, which break out each Bible book and a brief synopsis of the significance of that book. Praise God. And then the second lesson six says, now that you understand the now that you understand God's word to us, not once you understand how we got the Bible. OK, written by many people over many generations, all coming together to put together one set of text that then gets connected in series and those series then eventually become uh, um, a, a re readable because, OK, the Bible was found in different pieces. OK, and some of the pieces weren't complete. So they had to merge documents of the same page. OK, so that they could create a series so they could get the complete page. And in the process, they would label it and they would give it a label and say, this is this series. And the historians and the scholars would make sure that there was no red acting, meaning nobody added stuff in there. And that there weren't false copies so, 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 slide, slid in there, that they weren't actual true archaeological finds. And then once they did that, they would label it. And so anybody doing any research would then be able to ask, OK, well, what's the label for this series? And then by that label, they could determine what scholarly work was done to authenticate it. 
it's relatively complicated. And beyond Bible survey, perhaps we will do a whole semester on how we got the Bible, because reality is you could do a study on that and that alone. Once we've covered that, and we know it's God's word to us, and we understand its divisions, we now have to understand that God also worked dispensationally. So he made a promise in Genesis 3.15, and he created a system called the patriarchy. The first patriarch, a lot of people say, is Abraham, which is true. But Noah was also considered a patriarch because he was the father of all that was living once after the flood. Okay, so we have the patriarch, and then we have the mosaic, and then we have Christian grace. Sometimes it's looked at in a simpler form, starlight, moonlight, sunlight, and some say patriarchal, Jewish, mosaic, Christian, and then some say promise, law, grace. That's on page 32 and 33 of your book. Okay, and saints, this is recorded and it stays shared there on YouTube. It's easy to find and easy to locate. So if you bit the book later and you say, wow, I want to read go over that video where that guy was discussing the book. Go ahead and order the book, Training for Service, student book, all right, written by Oren. Oh, excuse me. I got this thing on mirror. So no, I, I'm moving in one direction and it's moving in the other by Oren Root. OK, and you can order the book and you can go back over this and, and you can be blessed by it. It's, it's, it's going to be a great blessing. So we look at it from a standpoint of dispensations. And then uh, Lesson 7 starts talking about the Old Testament world and outlines, um, you know, the, the nations and, and where we where we lived, excuse me, where they lived, where the empires were. This is good to know when you know that the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and, and the Egyptians, where, the, where they were relative to the nation of Israel at the time of these wars and these different stories in the Old Testament. So that's on page 35 that map and that's lesson seven i don't want to overrun my lesson plan here let me just make sure uh, yeah we're up to 11. okay good all right so we're in lesson seven and then we're going to go over to lesson eight lesson eight old testament people now you heard me say know the story know the books know the books know the story same thing with the people Know the people, know the story, know the books, okay? So if you know the story of Adam, Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Nehemiah, you pretty much have run through the full backbone of the, New Test of the Old Testament. If you know these guys' stories, then you know the story of the nation of Israel, okay? And so Lesson 8 talks about Old Testament people, who each one of these men were. Amen. And then lesson nine is Old Testament people, part two. And it starts to talk a little bit more about a Saul, the first king, then King David, then King Solomon, and Elijah, the prophet, Isaiah, the, the what they call the gospel prophet, because Isaiah is quoted more as a prophetic confirmation of Christ than any other historical prophetic book. And then Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, because he was the prophet that prophesied that the southern kingdom was going into exile. The northern kingdom had already been overrun. So that would have been the complete fall of the nation. OK. And then uh, Daniel, the brave who, while in exile, served King, King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nehemiah, the restorer, the governor who helped restore the wall and to reestablish the Jewish kingdom once again. Lesson 10 talks about Old Testament periods. I love this one. This one's one of my favorite ones because it talks about how the ascension, the, the, the ascension, the, the, the peak, and then the decline of discipleship. So it talks about probation, preparation, conquest, power, decline, servitude. Amen. And so how many of us can relate to that, right? We go to a period of probation, right? And then we go to a period of preparation for our call. And then we begin to conquer in our call. And then we gain power. And I'm going to tell you a secret. Probation, preparation is where character is built. Conquest is where strength is built. When you have character and you have strength, you have power. That's four. The grit of how well you're prepared in character will determine whether you go into decline and servitude. And probation, 
Preparation, conquest, and power is necessary. Decline and servitude are not necessary. They are optional, but we seem to tend to go through them anyway sometimes, right? And then we go on to Lesson 11, and Lesson 11 talks about Old Testament periods, Part 2, and it talks about um, the experience in the wilderness, the conquest of Canaan, the rulership of the judges, and then, of course, the entry of the kings, okay, King Saul and then King David. Of course, the you know that King Solomon is the one who creates the decline that results in them splitting up the kingdoms after his death, okay? So um, we'll be going into lesson 12 next week. Praise God. And that'll begin the end. That'll be the end of our quick review of Training for Service, the student book. It's an excellent book. I strongly recommend it. I don't make any money off of it. I don't have any stock in the company. I'm just telling you that it's a good book to read and to learn from. Praise God. Then now we're going to go through the Bible in a year. And this is going to be powerful. Um, I love this book too. Um, that's this book, 52 week, 52 lessons, introdu introduction to the Bible, 66 books. And you go through training for service. You go through this book and you go through the lecture portions that we're doing here. And you get a good pass through the whole word. And, and you'll get a good understanding at an institute level of the word of God. And like I said, you'll end up with an institute diploma. Praise the Lord. So, and you'll have completed your first year towards your associates, which then will be your first year towards your bachelor's, which will then be your first year towards your next bachelor's. So, we're, we're, we're definitely willing to bless you if you're willing to do the work. Praise the Lord. So lesson one, again, also talks about the Bible as a whole. And I'm just going to tell you that the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, these first five books of the Bible, which we refer to as the law, the, 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 the Jewish community refers to as the Torah. This, the, the Torah is basically the foundation of wisdom. And so a lot of Christians don't know the Torah. They don't think they need to know the Torah. There's nowhere in the Bible that says you're not supposed to know it. It just says you're not bound by the laws in it. But you are bound by the spirit. And the spirit will affirm sin. And a sin is revealed through the Torah. So it's like a catch-22. You do need to know your Torah. In fact, in the Jewish community, before a young man goes to his first bar mitzvah, okay, boom. He has to know the book of Leviticus, okay? And I believe before he's actually fully adult, he, he actually learns the whole Torah. But Leviticus is taught to them from childhood, okay? So you do need to know the Torah. If you're a Christian, you'll know your Torah. There's, it's not a good scene. That's not a good look. And I know that's going to be hard to accept because a lot of churches don't teach that. Oh, we're not under law. We're under grace. But grace from what? How can you know what sin is if you don't know the Torah? So the Torah defines what is sin. So every single Christian should know their Torah. I know that's a radical thought for the Western Christian mindset. But if you search out first century biblical teaching, you'll find that you were encouraged to know it. You might not as a Gentile been bound under it, but you were encouraged to know it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So uh, the Bible as a whole is lesson one. It breaks down the books again. We've already kind of done that with train for service. Then it goes into Genesis a little bit more deeply. It breaks down the story of Adam and Eve, and it breaks down the lineage to Noah, and then it breaks down the flood, okay? And then it breaks down the call of Abraham, and then it breaks down the patriarchal covenant all the way down to Joseph. And then, of course, they're now in Egypt because of the famine, the great famine that struck the whole world. Lesson three is the book of Exodus. They have now served this kingdom for 300 years, for 400 years rather. And a new Pharaoh rises up that did not remember Joseph's great work. And he decides the Jews are a threat, incarcerates them and punishes them. And this has been going on for 400 years. And the end result is that now God is going to call them out through Moses. And that's lesson three, the book of Exodus. The book of Leviticus, I like to refer to it as the Ketubah book. That's a lock. That's a marriage contract. So if you don't know what a ketubah is, go look it up. It's the, in Judaism. That's what a marriage contract looks like. Leviticus is the nation of Israel ketubah with God. Okay. And so uh, lesson four, uh, if you look at it from that perspective, doesn't come off as dry, right? Because you're starting to actually get into the deep, intimate, relational pieces. Praise God. 
Then lesson number five is the book of Numbers. So Numbers counts a lot of things. It counts the people. It counts the 40 years they wanted in the desert. Okay, there's a lot of counting going on, a lot of uh, uh, accounting going on in the book of Numbers. Okay, and um, if you're wondering about the wandering in the desert and the counting of the nations, all that you're going to find in the book of Numbers. Okay, so now with some of this, some of this information, if someone starts talking to you about a story, you don't know exactly where it is. You can kind of get an idea where it is based on what the story is about. This story that I'm telling you about happened while they were in Egypt. Then it's in Exodus. This happened while they were wandering the desert. Okay, so then that means it's possible that it could be in Exodus. It's possible it could be in Leviticus or Numbers. Okay. No, this was the children that were raised up after, oh, then that has to be in Numbers or in Deuteronomy, you see? Because the idea is know the story, know the books, know the books, know the story, know the people, know the story, know the story, know the books. You see how we're teaching you? So we're teaching you from four or five different directions, all tying into a given point, and by so doing, it gives you the ability to remember it and to have a good grasp of where things are in the word. And lesson six is the book of Deuteronomy. Think of duo done twice. This is the second reading of the law. And so if it's about a law, you might find it in Deuteronomy or you might find it in Leviticus. Deuteronomy goes into a little bit more detail. The purpose of Deuteronomy is that when they received Leviticus, they were supposed to march to the promised land. When God rejected them and said, you're not going in, but your children are going to go in, the children were minors at the time of the reading of the law in Leviticus. So they needed a second reading of the law so that they could accept the ketuvah, okay, and accept the marital contract before they went into the promised land. Again, know the story, know the books. Then the book of Joshua, well, who took him into the promised land? Well, we know Moses struck the rock, right? He got angry with the people. And instead of operating in accordance with respect of God's holiness, he did what he wanted to do in that particular situation. He struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. And the end result was he was not allowed to go in the promised land. So Joshua took him in the promised land. Again, know the person, know the book, know the story, know the person and the book. So Joshua is the one that takes them into conquest, into the promised land, the book of Joshua. Now, God never wanted to give them a king because God was their king. And so God is like, I'm going to give you judges. Every time you get out of line, I'm going to let you get punished. You're going to go into decline and servitude. See, you're going to see a lot of this. You see a lot of this, a lot of probation, preparation, conquest, power, right? And then decline and servitude because the character developed in probation and preparation didn't carry them and hold them in conquest and power. Probation, necessary. Preparation, necessary. Conquest, necessary. Power, necessary. Because God is powerful. You can't be in God and not gain power. Decline and servitude, optional, not required. But unfortunately, they don't tend to listen. And so what would happen is he would raise up judges. And those judges would help them, war them back into power, war them back into conquest. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you do not obey me, I will curse you. If you continue not to obey me, I will curse you even worse. But if you didn't turn around and obey me, I will bless you. I'm where God is. God is not fickle. We're fickle. Okay. <laughs> That's right. God's not fickle. God's very consistent. We're fickle. So he has to roll with our fickleness to make us consistent. Amen. And so judges, book of Judges, the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth sort of explains the, 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 the value of loyalty to the kingdom of God and loyalty in God. But Judges is significant because that's how God wanted to rule the people. Remember, the people demanded a king. And so we get the story of first Samuel in which Samuel's sons were not a very righteous, not like him. And they were tired of this decline servitude judge business. And they thought what would be better for them is if God gave them a man king. And so God was upset about it. But God's like, you know what? That's what you want. You're going to get it. And he gives them their first king, Saul. And of course, Saul messes up. And then he gives them his second king, David. Lesson nine discusses the book of first Samuel. And lesson 10 discusses the book of second Samuel. I don't want to overrun my lesson plan here, 
uh, through the Bible in a year. We're up to lessons 15 through 17. So you're you're pretty good there. OK, so the first Samuel kind of talks about Saul, his reign, King David being crowned, but he's he's not seated on the throne yet. King David doesn't get to the throne till almost the end of first Samuel. OK, second Samuel is David's reign as king. Right. And then that covers lesson 10. Lesson 11 is the books of first and second kings. So it talks about the two crowns, the monarchies. Now, understand that there was a northern kingdom, 10 tribes and a southern kingdom, two tribes. OK, they were used to be one kingdom, 12 tribes. What happened? Solomon messed up. God said, I'm taking the kingdom from you, but I'm not going to take it from you for the sake of King David. I'm going to take it from your son. OK, and he took it from his son and the 10 southern northern tribes broke away and the two southern tribes remained uh, 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 as, as, as as Jerusalem, as Jews. OK, not that the 10 northern tribes weren't Jews, but you're going to find they get overrun by the Assyrians and they lose almost their entire Jewish identity and they start being referred to as the Samaritans. So actually, the southern tribe remained Jews while the northern tribe ultimately became Samaritans. We have the we have the benefit of the knowledge of what happened after the fact. And that's first and second Kings. They went into exile, though. Even the Jews went into exile to, to Babylon and they kind of lost a degree of their identity while they were in Babylon. So when they came back, there was really a need to chronicalize their history so that they could reclaim their identity. And in chronicalizing their history to regain their identity, they tell more of the tale of the temple. OK, then they tell the tale of the kings because their identity is more associated with the temple than their identity is with the kings. So first and second Chronicles chronicalizes the history of the temple. Amen. And so it's also like Deuteronomy, a second giving of the history of the history. Praise the Lord. Lesson 13, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra was responsible for rebuilding. There are, there are fundamentally, I'm thinking now, Three or four things the Jews have to establish. One, they must be in covenant agreement with God to be the bride, to give birth to the child. So there's a covenant agreement. That's the Mosaic law. Then there's enmity between him and the woman. That enmity, that needs to emanate. The enmity needs to emanate from um, a division. So they have to have their own nation. And have your own nation, of course, you had to have a wall. You had to have a wall surrounding your nation and not only operate as an events, it was a delineating mark. You cross over this wall, you're inside our nation, you're subject to our laws. If you're not supposed to be there, you're going to be punished. And if you are there and you break any of our laws, you will be punished. So you're inside our nation. There is a division. There's enmity between what we're doing and what everybody else is doing. OK, you must have. So you have to have that law. You have to have that enmity. Right. And you must have a temple. Because God resides in the temple. This is the establishes you as this is what such a great battle. Um, we as Christians see ourselves as the temple. And we do have some people that look up to an edifice building, but there aren't many people that do that anymore. There was a huge time in Christianity where we looked up to cathedrals as an edifices, but we've matured and realized we're the temple. But in ancient Judaism, the temple was the symbolism of their absolute righteousness. In fact, you couldn't obey the Torah completely without the temple because sacrifices had to take place in the temple and you couldn't do the sacrifices without the temple. So without the temple, you can't obey the Mosaic law completely. This is what the big fight is in the Middle East for right now is because the place where the temple is supposed to sit is divided in two between the Jews and the Palestinians. And at the time, uh, and, and the time and the time is coming, well, at least we believe, where it ultimately will end up in the hands of the Jews, um, because the Bible teaches that they're going to reestablish the temple. OK, so, you know, uh, but that's a prophecies that we're not going to get into right now. So I don't want to argue that point. We might have some easy tensions with some people on that. We'll leave that alone. It's not a political discussion about warfare and governments. This is a prophetic discussion about what God said is going to happen. And whether or not he said it, it meant that or he meant something else. I say that only because some people uh, have adopted a political climate over this, but there's no place for us as disciples to adopt a political climate over this. It's not our place. 
our place is to obey God and to serve him the way he instructed us to. And it will play out the way he said it would play out. We are on a more hands off position because God said, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit shall you overcome. And it's very clearly laid out in Revelations that we're not to engage in the physical battles of this whole situation. We're just to be the righteous sheep that they're ultimately going to persecute because they just can't accept God's holiness. Praise God. But Nehemiah is responsible for rebuilding the wall. That's the division. And Ezra is responsible for reestablishing the temple. This is after they came back from exile in Babylon. That remember, in order for the Jewish people to be the children of God, they've got to have the covenant arrangement through the Mosaic law, the ketubah. They've got to have division because that's Genesis 3.15 and the tea between them and the woman. And they have to have a temple which establishes them as the absolute holy presence of Yahweh. Without those three things, they cannot fulfill their purpose. So when they went off into exile, the temple got dilapidated, the wall got half torn apart, okay? And so when they came back from exile, the first thing God wanted was the reestablishment of the temple and the wall. And that's that's Ezra and, Go and the, Ezra the priest and Nehemiah the governor. Praise the Lord, making good time, all right. And then we have the book of Esther. I love Esther. Um, a lot of men, you want to just jump over Esther. Okay, that's the sister's book, man. You know, take the woman's group. Y'all go do the book of Esther. But the reality is Esther is a prophetic typology of the ecclesia, God's chosen people. The ecclesia is here in occupied territory, much like Esther lived in occupied territory. Okay. And she was under attack. The people were under attack from Laman. I mean, Haman. I said Laman. It's Haman. Okay. He was under, she was under attack from Haman. And we're under attack from um, prophetic Hamites on the earth today. Okay. And Haman conspired to wipe out all the Jews. And these Hamites that exist today, okay, call them Hamites, but I could call them something else. <laughs> they are trying to destroy the church. They are trying to commit religious genocide, okay? Completely destroy Christianity because it does not agree with their plan. They have a hatred towards authentic Christianity. They don't have a hatred towards the word Christian. They have a hatred towards authentic Christianity, okay? And so he's dealing with, she's dealing with Haman, and we're dealing with these prophetic Hamites, okay? And she has to stand up to them, and we have to stand up to these Hamites, okay? She didn't stand up by violence. She didn't stand up by might or power or military force. She stood up in righteousness and holiness. And so we also are not called to stand up by might or by power or by authority, but we are also called to stand up by righteous authority in the spirit, she could have lost her life going before the king, okay, and trying to present herself without being summoned and admitting that she was a Hebrew because she was hiding the fact that she was a Hebrew because Hebrews were looked down upon, revealing that she was a Hebrew and revealing and coming to the king without his request for her presence, he could get killed and you revealing that you're a Christian, right, and you revealing that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, which is looked down upon in this world we live in today, right? And we also are risking our lives and our livelihood for the very same reasons, praise God. And so that book of Esther has a lot of typological uh, significance, praise God. And then lesson 15, the book of Job. Okay, Job, powerful man of God, anointed in every way, wasn't a Jew, was like a cousin of Abraham. So what's, what, what's that tell you? That tells you that God was not just working with the Jews. He gave the Jews an assignment. But he was also working with other people in different areas in different ways. And I, I think back to the time when the apostles were asking Jesus what he was going to do with the, the, the beloved. What are you going to do with him? And we, a lot of us believe John, John uh, the apostle, was the beloved. And so he said, what, what's he going to do with the beloved? And he said, why does that have anything to do with you? I gave you an assignment, go do that. If I want him to remain on this planet until I come back, why is that any of your concern? 
See, I listen to the Lord when he speaks and because I'm looking for the sweeping meaning. And one of the sweeping meaning is mind your business. If you're on assignment, do your assignment. Some things are not any of your business. And so at the end of the day, Job, out of nowhere, come out of nowhere, a cousin of Abraham, who ultimately lives this righteous and holy life as a man of God, but not part of the Mosaic law, not part of the Mosaic covenant, something got something else God was doing. Praise God. Very interesting and worthy of investigation. All right. Job was not Jewish. Praise the Lord. All right. So I'm finished with my section. I'm done. Praise God. We're going to turn it over now to Pastor Trina Houston from Greater Grace Ministries. Thank you all for the encouraging comments in the chat. Um, any questions or anything, you can put them in the chat. we got Apostle Jen there to answer questions. And also, we can also answer some of the questions from here as well. I'm surrendering it now to uh, Pastor Trina Houston. At uh, Numbers 10, 14, and 15. Um, and so there, there is a lot of information in these scriptures. So I'm going to try to um, recall as much as I can with a little uh, notes that I had to kind of remind me of some of the things. Um, and so in chapter 19, it began to talk about um, the ordinance of the red heifer. And so God was telling his people and he was redirecting this new generation because mind you, uh, the older generation has started to die out. And so he was trying to redirect this new generation to what was acceptable to God. And so um, it talked about this red heifer. And one of the things that I just thought, and I'm just throwing this in there um, by way of amen, some information, that this was the first time that they used a female uh, animal for sacrifice. I thought that was kind of interesting. I never looked at that before, but if you go back and you check, you'll see that this is the first time that they really use a female. So um, he was talking once again about um, dead stuff, dead stuff. Listen, God is talking about this again. So that should throw flags up to us. When he started talking about dead stuff, how you handle dead stuff, it talked about how um, if somebody died, anybody that was in a house with that dead person became unclean. Anybody that came into the house where the dead person was became unclean. Everything about this dead thing that touched it in any kind of way became unclean. And so that tells us when we... Um, and listen, and uncleanliness, again, was like as the sin of leprosy, where it, it will defile you and you need to be put outside of the camp until you become well again, until you become whole again. And so it tells us, like, when we are dealing with um, sin issues, we have to be so very careful um, about where we go, what we see, what we hear, what we do, because those things become send to us if it's not done in the glory of God. We can allow things to pull us off sides. Um, and then just like uh, that dead person or just like leprosy, it gets in us. It contaminates us when we begin to deal with things that are not holy. Because a dead person is not holy. It was deemed as unclean. And um, I remember on um, Wednesday last week, we were talking about how... Um, being apart from, uh, you know, when, when a person died, the per so the family, let's go here, the family of that dead person, um, they became unclean because they were in the house with that dead person. So number one, um, it's a sanitary kind of issue because God is wise. He knows um, things that we need to do, even if we don't even understand. And so um, it, it became um, a, a sanitary issue. But one of the things that's most impactful is that it gave the family time to mourn. Because it said that when somebody was in the room or around an a, a unclean person, they had to go through this ritual. But it took them at least seven days in, before they became clean again. So it allowed the person um, that was um, around a dead person to mourn. And watch this, mourn away from other people other than those that were um, um, directly infected or affected by this dead person. So when in the cleaning process, it talked about how 
um, the priest would have to kill this red heifer. Now listen, the red heifer, um, it it um, it didn't really have anything to do with the sacrifice. They needed the ashes of this red heifer. Mind you, they needed to burn this red heifer completely because they needed the the ashes to be mixed with purified water. And so um, there's speculation that when they did this, that the, it, it became a red color. And so it, 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 if you think about it and you apply it to the blood of Christ, uh, which makes one clean, we can kind of see the correlation in that. Um, and so one of the things is like, so why did they have to do this? They, because if you think about it, um, the children of Israel, they began to move. They, they were moving. They were always moving. They couldn't, when somebody died, um, set up the tent and go and offer a sacrifice. And then they needed something that would um, make it uh, more acceptable as they were moving. They needed to do something that the priest can do directly to the people or directly to the family or directly as they were moving. Because now we're going to a place. And so um, it, in my, it, it told me, then this is me, and I always say that this is me, and I'm thinking and I'm sharing with you that sometimes when God is doing something for us and he's doing something with us, um, sometimes it won't seem like what we think it's supposed to. We would think that we would need to go find a priest if we were back then. And we would need to make this offer and we need to make this sacrifice and he would need to do, you know, all of the traditions that was happening if the tent was set up. But sometimes God will make provisions for us so that we won't have to stop what we're doing, but we can continue to move in him. We, we, here's a, here's a great scripture. It says that we as Christians don't grieve like the world grieves. We don't, we, we have a hope. And so the children of Israel, their hope was to get to the promised land. And can you imagine it was all the grumbling that they were already doing if somebody in my family had died and we had to stop camp on our walk. Now we already been wandering 40 years. We got to stop again every time somebody and somebody died in the family. But listen, they were dying off. So would they ever get anywhere? So again, God in his wisdom, he made this where the priest could um, take the hyssop and dip it into the the mixture and they could clean every third and seventh day, um, make uh, the people ceremonial clean, clean again. So, you know, God is just merciful. He, he's always looking for ways to provide for us so that we can keep moving. We can keep, we won't get stagnant. We won't get stuck in where he's taking us. And so um, it also talked about, um, so, so interestingly, um, I was reading, and so when I was reading about this, um, this cleansing and stuff like that, of course, it takes us back to Christ, right? And in First John, I read this. It says that we're to walk in the light as He is in the light, and we have no, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin, and that light is the Word of God. We know that the light is the Word of God. And so if we walk in a light, what do we see? Well, we see that we need to be cleansed. And so we can see how the cleansing back then and now us walking in the light of Christ by his word shows us that we too must be cleansed. We need the blood of Christ. We need that, that red mixture, that blood of Christ to cleanse us because without the blood of Christ, we as Christians cannot be cleansed. We can't. Um, so the spirit of the Lord convicts us. Thank God for the spirit of the Lord. And what does the spirit of the Lord represent? It represents water. In some cases, water represents the spirit of the Lord. So we need the, the, the spirit of the Lord to convict us. And we need the word, which is the light, to cleanse us. And so we can see the correlation, how God is just continually, he showed us back then, he shows us again, how how things are working together. It worked together for them and it still works together for us.
Um, some people think that, um, and then I thought about in church, you know, sometimes we can, we can live our lives and it feel like if we go to church, then we're doing okay. But that's not necessarily true. How many of us know that there's folk in church that are not saved? They have not allowed the word of God to wash them clean. They have not allowed the blood of Christ to, to um, make them clean. They, they haven't done that. They haven't applied those things in their life. They're just coming to church as a habit, a, a ritual to, to get up on Sunday, get dressed in their fighting clothes and go to church. And they're not getting anything cleansed off of them. So that's just like um, back then what happened was when the people died, and the, and, the, and the dead body contaminated everything else. People that are not clean contaminates everybody else around them because they have no nothing that's washing them clean. They don't go by the word of God, which will cleanse them. So they're going to contaminate everybody else around them because they're going to go by what they think, not by the word of God. And so we have to be careful that we allow the word to wash us clean. And so... Um, all that, that situation with the, the red heifer, the red, the blood, the, you know, it, it, it calls to mind what we need now. We still need Christ. We need the blood of Christ now. We need the Holy Spirit now to wash us, to keep us clean, to convict us. And so we can see all that playing out in chapter 19. Just a different way to look at that scripture. And I dare you, when you go back to look at it, to look at it in that light how it um, God was working something back then for a truth right now. Amen. So then in chapter 20, um, again, we, we see how they were complaining um, about they, they didn't have anything to drink. And um, listen, so Moses <laughs> was with these people for 40 years. Um, they were, they were, they were it, during this wilderness time, he was still with them. Now they didn't complain before they were dying out. They did 40 years and now here they are new generation and they're still complaining. And Moses, I mean, can you imagine, um, being a, a supervisor on your job? Um, and you started when a business might've started and you, you know, you're, you, you hear the complaints of the people, you, you handling the complaints of the people, um, you stay in there, people are leaving, new people are coming in, but the new people are complaining. Like, you're like, what in the world? And so Moses had to have gotten tired, had to have been frustrated because he's been doing this for all this longer time. And so as Aaron, Aaron seeing the people, he's seeing what they were going through. Listen, and every time that they went through that, the spirit of the Lord, the, it says that the, the glory of the Lord would come when the people murmured. So listen, so it, it, it's like God saying, hey, listen, you're murmuring again and I'm coming to see you. But so many times God was merciful and still provided for the people because watch this. So when they murmured this time, we don't have any water. Moses is like, listen, you want me to, you know what? I'm going to get you some water. You want water? I'm going to get you water. Me and Aaron, we're going to get you some water. So he strikes, we know the story, he strikes the rock two times. And what he didn't do was he, the Lord had told him to speak to the rock, to speak to the rock, not to smite the rock, but to speak to the rock. And um, it is compared to um, Jesus Christ. Um, and his life, Jesus was only smitten once. He, he only died one time. He only had to die one time. But when Moses struck the rock, he struck the rock two times. And listen, and this is not the first time that Moses was given direction as to handle this rock. What are you doing? How are you handling the rock, Christ Jesus? Are you causing... Number one, him to be crucified over and over and over again every time you sin, every time you want something, every time you think something is not fair. Are you crucifying Christ? Are you, or, or can you look in a mirror and see the image of Christ 
even in your pain and suffering, even when it's not going your way, even when it gets a little tight, can you still see the image of God in you? Can you see it? And so he smote the rock. And so God, listen, because the first time when he, when God told Moses to do it, he told us to do it in front of the elders. And Moses did what God told him to do in front of the elders. This time, when God told him to speak to the rock, he wanted Moses to speak to the rock so that God himself would get glory out of the people and the people will recognize that, listen, everything that I get, this is God saying to the people, you get from me. So when Moses said, you know what? Me and Aaron, we're going to do this. We're going we gonna to bring you, we're going to get you some water. Moses took that glory for himself and he didn't give it to God. And so therefore, because Moses did that in front of the people, God punished them in front of the people. And so um, we know that, you know, um, even, even, even us, you know, we have to allow God to handle us anyway. Listen, God is sovereign. He can do what he wants to do. We're going to talk about that when we get to verse uh, chapter 22, because if, God, listen, if God can use whom or what he wants to, to get his point across, and he can use you if you remain humble, but if you want to just go your own way and do it your own way, and you're going to end up sinning and not giving God glory, but he's still going to get his way. So, um, so Moses was, was told that he couldn't go into the promised land. But, I, you know, I, I, I read something very interestingly enough that um, though Moses at that time didn't get to the promised land with the children of Israel, we see him on Mount Transfiguration. And so we know that despite what Moses did, God still honored him in, in the work that he did. So listen, the Psalms 37 tells us, you know, we can't be envious of those evildoers. We can't be envious when we see people that seem like they're getting ahead and getting by and getting, they're not getting anywhere. God is going to judge righteously. We have to be, listen, as a lamb. All right, Lord, I hear you. Amen. So, um, yeah, that's another, that's another sermon. So, um, uh, so, so that people began to murmur again. And, um, it said that, of course, it caused Moses to sin. And, um, it, listen, so the people, as they were beginning to move, because they went from, um, wandering, in these chapters, because we're going to chapter 22, they went from wandering to beginning to march into their promised land. So there's, there's, listen, so sometimes when you feel like you're in a wilderness place, it's there for a season. God's trying to work something in you or work something out of you, but there, you're not going to stay in the wilderness. That's not God, God's plan for anybody is to just stay in the wilderness. He wants you to, he has a, a place that he's trying to bring you to. And though sometimes like, it's just like this. Um, if you have clothes <coughs> and they're dirty, you put them in a wash machine. Why? Because you need to get some dirt or something out of it. <coughs> so watch this. So if you take it out the washing machine and you still see that um, it's still dirty, you may put it back in. You may add some extra stuff just so you can get it clean. God wants his people to be clean. They, he wants them to be faithful to him because he's being faithful to them. Because just like when Moses sinned, even though Moses sinned, God still gave them water. He still gave them what he still provided for them. He provided for them all those 40 years. They, it said that their feet never swelled, their, their, their sandals never wore out. God did that because the people belong to him. Don't we belong to him? 
He's going to provide for, listen, there's nothing new under the sun. And the way that he cared for them is the way that he cares for us. But we have the scriptures so that we can learn from their mistakes and we don't have to do the same mistake again. So look, after 37 years, they ended up in Kadesh again. And so while they were in Kadesh, of course, what did the people do? They murmured again. They murmured again. This time they murmured against um, um, Aaron and Moses. And so, listen, they were, they were, one of the things that they kept saying is like, you know, we, you, we, we wish you just left us in, in Egypt where, you know, we had this in Egypt, we had that in Egypt and we don't want to keep walking through this land. And listen, do you know that we are pilgrims in this land? And so when we come up with hardships, are we murmuring? Do we murmur? When we come up with hardships, oh, Lord, here we go again. This lady at my job, and na, 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 na. And, oh, Lord, I, I can't make, I, I don't know how I'm going to make this bill. Oh, God, I don't know. Are we murmuring? We are pilgrims just like they were, moving through a land just like they were. But are we murmuring like them? And if we are, then that means that we're not trusting God. So where's your faith? How about this? I used to tell this to myself. Get your faith up. Get your faith up. All right. So they're, they're murmuring again. They're whining and complaining. Um, and so that's when he, M M Moses struck the rock. And I just had to go back because, listen, they were in Kadesh again. This is me. They were there before. Here they are again, a new generation, and they're still murmuring. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of Remind us, like, we, we are the same pilgrims. We're still traveling, but are we murmuring still? Okay. So as they were going through, Edom refused to let the children of Israel pass through their land. And we know that um, Edom and, I, I'm, you know, were um, it, the descendants of Esau. And so they did not fight against them. They did not fight against them. They, um, but they didn't allow them to go through their land. So what the children of Israel had to do is they had to go around us, go around them. And so sometimes, you know, it, you know, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when we're trying to get from one place to another, we see, we feel like there's um, detours and stuff. The traffic is heavy. You know, we got to slow down. We got to be rerouted. And things like that because things are in our way but sometimes God allows things to get in our way because he needs us to still continue to trust and rely on him be able to hear his directions because I wonder you know if you've been following the class you know there was a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night and I wonder what happened to that pillar because had they did what God wanted them to do, they would have been able to follow that pillar and wouldn't have had no incidents. So sometimes we have to be so very careful because God can take his hands off of stuff that are meant to bless us because we complain and we, we argue and we, we, we throw in um, insinuations at those that, that God's put in positions and we just putting our mouths all over every, and then we're unclean. Right. So in um, chapter 20, um, it started with the death of Miriam, but it ended with the death of Aaron, right? Sister and brother, they're still part of that old generation that needs to die out, no matter how important they seem to be, because when they talked about Miriam, and I'm not, you know, d please don't don't inbox me. But when they when they talked about Miriam, it was like what one verse? Miriam died and they buried her. And then they talked about Aaron and he died. And it said that they mourned for Aaron for 30 days. And so, but watch this. It was Aaron that they went to when they had to send. And when they had to bring a sacrifice, 
they had to go to Aaron. And I'm sure, listen, I thought about it. If I was, if I had to bring, if I knew I did something wrong and I'm bringing a, a sacrifice to Aaron, I'm, I'll probably be like, hey, Aaron, here's my lamb. You think the Lord going to forgive me? You think, you think this going to be enough? That I, I, I don't have a lamb. I got these two turtles. You think this is going to be enough? You think God's going to be pleased with this? You think I'm going to be all right, Aaron? They didn't have to do that with Miriam, but they had to go to the priest. How important that priest is. We have a priest. We do. We don't have a priest um, in the order of Aaron, but we have, we have a priest. Amen. That will never die. That always makes it okay for us. So, um, and, and like I said before, Aaron still was with these people for 40 years. So they knew Aaron and Aaron knew most of them. So when he died, the people mourned. Okay. And so when, when before Aaron died, uh, Moses had to take Aaron up to in the mountains and take his son and he had to strip Aaron of his garments and put it on his son. So when the people saw the son come down with Aaron priestly garment, they knew what had happened. Can you imagine the one that you shared all your pain with, your family? Oh, my sister died and I got to go outside. Aaron, make sure you come on the third day. The third day is going to be through. I'm going to send word when the third day get here because I know the third day for me might not be the third day for somebody else, but I need you to come see about me, Aaron, because I need to be cleansed. Wow. Isn't it so important that God comes sees about us? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need no reminders. He already knows what we need before we even say it. Yeah. So, amen. So then, um, um, chapter 21, um, they get to come. I, it seems like every time I talk about this, every week I'm saying how they complain. So, of course, they complained again. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is the last time that they complained before they reached their promised land. So there's hope. There's hope. There is hope. You know, um, there's even hope for us. Because even if we've been complaining, now there's hope that we ain't got to complain no more. So that kind of, that blessed me indeed. Um, so they, 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 they began to march and they complain. And um, God sent the punishment this time um, when they complained. And it was the um, the snakes. It was the snakes. And it said that um, when they complained and got sent uh, uh, poisonous snakes to bite the people. And um, listen, they were complaining about they didn't have nothing to eat. They tired of the manna. They, they you know, this, that. God, everything that they got, they got from God, yet they want to complain. And listen, so sometimes when you don't directly want to complain to God, you make somebody else your issue. Now they're your issue when, frankly, you're mad at God. And God knew this. God already knew. And so God said this. Listen, he said, you know what? If you're going to complain, I'm going to make you look up in faith. You will have to look up and live. And so sometimes when we find ourselves complaining, when we find ourselves without faith, we need to learn to look up. We have to look up to Christ. We have to look up to the heaven from whence coming for our help. We know that's what the scriptures say. We have to look up. So God sent the, the fiery serpents. And they bit the people and they began to die. So they had to look at this brazen bronze serpent in faith to be healed. So listen, they didn't have the faith to stop complaining. But God sure made sure they had to have the faith to live. So amen. Um, it says if a man would not turn to look at the serpent, he would die. Isn't that the same for Christ? And see, so this is why people wonder how, how the correlation is. 
if we don't look up to Christ, if we don't understand who he is, what he's done for us, how he became a sacrifice for us so that we can live, we have to look up to Christ in order to live. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, um, he said, just as what Jesus said, he said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. So if you're listening today, look up and live. Amen. Um, so when we look at Christ, we're going to be looking at him um, as our savior because either you're a sinner or you're, you're continuing, you're living in sin. Or um, either you're going to look at him because you're a sinner Listen, because I said, look up. Or you're going to look up or you're not going to do it. So um, if you're not going to do it, it don't mean, it don't, it doesn't, listen, if you don't look, listen, this is the severity of this. If you don't actually, actually look up to Christ as your savior and live by, because of what he's done, I don't care if you go to church every Sunday. I don't care if you got baptized every fifth year on the fifth year of your anniversary or your baptism, you get baptized again. I don't I don't care what you do. If you don't, you're not looking up to Christ because you're a sinner and need salvation and you want to live, you're 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 not gonna live. You're going to die in your sin. Amen. Um it, it, it just doesn't matter. So going forward, um, we're still in, in, in chapter 21. Um, God sends the punishment of, of the serpents. Um, they needed to be healed with the bronze um, snake. Um, and then they continue on in their journey. And listen, they, um, while, during this time, they sung their first song. Um, their first song of praise and thanksgiving um <laughs> i was reading something about you know they were singing all this long a time they were complaining they were singing the desert blues i got the blues da, 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 the desert blues they were just they, they were a mess <laughs> they were singing the desert blues um and they were murmuring but now that they began to move forward in their victory, um, they began to sing songs of praise. Amen. Um, they were thanking God for the provisions that, that he made for them. Um, and, and even in the supplying of water, because somewhere along the line in our walk, we have to know, listen, anybody with any kind of thinking mind can look at your life and know that there has to be a God. You can look at some of your friends who are now saved and you grew up with them and, and you got to know that there's a God. If you knew my life, you can look at my life and say, gee, what? Oh, yeah, it's a God. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so so they began to, to, to sing songs of praise and thanksgiving to God because now, okay, God promised us this and now we see it coming together because we're no longer... Um, just wandering through the around and around and around this mountain. Now we're moving forward. Even though we're, we're, we're facing some opposition, we're moving forward. God is steadily moving us. And if something's in our way that we can't fight, God moves it around us because um, it, it may be um, s something that we need or something that we have a connection with that we, we can't get rid of, that we need to, this, that God has, there so he moves us around them but then there's some conquests that he wants us to win because we need to kill some things in order for us to get to our promised land we have to defeat some things so that we can get to our promised land 
And so they began to march and God gave them some victories and he gave them some victories and he gave them some more victories. God gives us victories as we're marching in the direction that he wants us to do. We're going to come against people that want to, 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 to do harm to us. Those that don't want us to get to our, they don't listen. The people didn't want them marching through their land. No, no, don't march through him. You march through here, we going we going one, one of the one of the group, I think it was the Canaanites, they want marched through there and they 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 took some of their people in the captive. And they're like, God, listen, if you give us victory over these Canaanites, we're gonna we're gonna take this land and we're gonna claim it for you and we're gonna um live here and we're gonna just take over the whole land and it's gonna become yours because we're your people. You know what God said? Go for it. You got it. Because they wanted to give God victory. At this time, we're moving where we're supposed to be going. We're going to give God victory. And so sometimes even in our lives, when we can see, when we begin to see how the hand of God is moving in our lives, we want to give God glory. We want to give him um, the praise, honor, and glory due in our victories. Because listen, people knew when they, they heard that they were coming and they were like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And this is what, this leads us up to chapter 22 about Balaam. The Israelites are coming. What are we going to do? There is a bunch of them and God's on their side too. I tell you what, now listen, I've, I've looked at this particular thing and there's two different ways that you can look at this. And listen, I don't know. I maybe, uh, I'm going to be honest and say, I'm not sure, I'm, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says that, um, there was this 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 guy Balaam, and he can consult with not only he, he was a consultant of gods. That's what it said. And so um, the the king the king of the land said, "Listen, um, we're going to go get this guy. And we're going to ask him to curse these people for us, um, and so that we can win oh, win them over, and we we don't have to when we go to fight them, we're going to win because you're going to curse them." And, and Balaam was like, okay, well, listen, um, let me, let me, let me talk to God and see what God says. And so he talked to God and listen, God said, nope, um, these are blessed people. You can't curse what I done blessed. That right there is a sermon. Nobody can curse what God has blessed. If you can see the blessing of the Lord on your life. Nobody can curse that. They can try. Listen, so they were trying, they, they wanted to send, they wanted to give Balaam all this uh, 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 notoriety and all this other stuff. Listen, just come and all that I want you to do is curse these people. They sent people two times. Say, come on, I just need you to come and curse these people. The first time he asked God, God said, no, you're not gonna curse these people. Leave it alone. They don't go their way. Don't even go. Uh, and these people are blessed. You can't curse them. So then they sent some more people, better people, stronger people, wiser people, more money. Whatever your weakness is. Is it more money that's your weakness that the enemy is going to send a second time? Is it, is, it, is it notoriety that you want? Is that what he's going to send a second time? Because what Balaam did was Balaam said, you know what? Let me go. Let me, let me, let, okay. I see that over there. Uh, let me go and let me go and, 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 and ask God and see what he says. God already told you no. God already told you no. Why are you going back? You want God to change his mind. You know what? Sometimes when my kids come to me and they say, um, mom, I'm X, Y, Z is the case. Can we X, Y, Z? And I'll say, um, no. Right. And then they'll come back and they say, well, my mom, you know, X, Y, Z and X, Y, Z is the case. And we're going to, you know, we're going to get off when you say get off if it's a game. And we're going to, we're going to not going to argue. We're going we gonna to do everything you want us to do. Can we say, I'm saying to myself, I already told them no. I said, you know what? You do what you think is right and let me see and, and tell me how that works out for you. So what, what God was saying, he's like, you know what? He, you act like you didn't understand when I told you the first time. No. 
okay? You can go with the people. I tell you what, don't say nothing that I ain't tell you to say. So now, you know, God's going, giving him some little leeway. My brother used to say this. My brother said, you know, if you give somebody a, um, a, um, give them an inch, they'll go a mile. You give them a, a, a person a rope, they want to be a cowboy. So, <laughs> so he he let he let them go, and then it, the Bible says this. Uh, where is the scripture? Uh, it's in I think it's in um, oh I think it's in John when it talks about Balaam. Um, his his intentions weren't right. His intentions weren't right when he went with those people. It's in scripture. I will find it for you. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to keep on talking because uh, we are on um, um, a time schedule. But his intentions weren't right. And so what happened was um, when he went, when he started going, it says that the angel of the Lord stood in front of the donkey. Now, listen, this is why, you know, some people say that uh, Balaam was a prophet of the Lord. He was a good guy. Some say he wasn't, he was um, working in divination. But let me, let me, let me just say this and let me make this clear to you. If a donkey can see the angel of the Lord and you're supposed to be a seer and you can't see him. Okay. So there evidently had to be something wrong right there. So, um, of course, I can't find the scripture now. Um, I think it's in I think it's in John though. It talks about Balaam. Y'all do the research. Y'all look for it. Tell me what it says. See if it talks about Balaam in a good light. But anyway, so the angel of the Lord stopped them, and Balaam is like, you know, he he beat up the donkey pretty much because the donkey wouldn't do what the, he wanted them to do. Yeah, and so <laughs> my mom went somewhere else, and so. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared when he appeared to Balaam. He's like, "Listen, what are you? What are you beating up the donkey? Of? I was about to kill you. The donkey saved you. How many times, you know, we we God will send something to save you, to keep you from hurt, harm, or danger, and you beat it up. You disregard it. You whatever the case may be. God is trying to get your attention sometimes, and He'll allow." Listen, and this is what I said. God can use anything. He can use, he used a donkey to speak to this man. Because the donkey turned around like, well, what you, bro, what you hit me for? I mean, don't, don't I usually do what you want me to do? What are you hitting me for now? <laughs> God can use whatever he wants to. But here's, here's another thing. Balaam didn't seem surprised when the donkey started talking. Kind of remind me of something in Genesis. But we're going we to put a pen there because, you know, that's going way out of the way. So, amen. So, so listen, God, God is, is, is continually guiding us and showing us certain things along our journey. He brings us out of wilderness places. He starts us on our way. We have to be attentive and listen and, and give God glory along the way, um, even if it seems hard, because some of them battles, I'm sure, seem hard to them. But if we continue to put our faith and trust in God, he's going to get grant us the victory. Why? Because we belong to him. And listen, he's a good father, and he's going to take care of his children. And all he wants is us to be faithful. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to, to um, keep our ways pure, follow his directions. It's all in scripture. It was in scripture then, it's in scripture now. Amen. So I'm, I think I'm gonna put a pin in it right there because uh, there, there's, there's just so much in these scriptures. I, I, I think I'll be here all night, but we don't have that kind of time. So I think I'm going to um, kind of relinquish some time back to Apostle. Amen. <laughs> uh.
Pastor, we can't hear you. Yeah, my mic was on mute. Sorry. So praise God, we can both stay up here. So uh, basically, you did make a mention of something and you wanted it reviewed. So I'm going to bring it up there. So it's in the book of Revelations, chapter two, verse 14. And it says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people that who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. So the backstory on Balaam is that Balaam went to curse the nation of Israel. Of course, God told him not to do it. He tried to do it anyway, but God twisted his mouth so that everything he said was a blessing. But Balaam did not return home. What he did was he hovered around looking to see ways he could he could help Balak. He was still looking for ways to help them. So when, it, when he got to the Midianites, he was also part of that group that told him, you will not be able to affect them or their God. You've got to get them in trouble with their own God. And that's when they got incited to commit sin, sexual immorality. And that sexual immorality sin caused God to punish the Israelites. And they were trying to do that to get God to wipe them out. God was so angry that the Midianites did this. He literally wiped out the Midianites. And when the Israelites went to wipe out all the men, they took the women as wives, but they wiped out all the men. Balaam was there. He got wiped out with them. So um, there'd be no question that Balaam, whatever role he might have played in the divination world, was not walking in perfect alignment with God. But notice God's faithfulness, gifts are given without repentance. But Amen. a powerful session. Amen. Amen. A powerful session. Um, I think it went very well. Saints, a few things are happening and we need to share them with you. First, we are going to be bringing this segment to an end. But, but... That's for a good reason. We're going to be bringing in place at 730 the two become one married ministry. First half hour is going to be a stream yard presentation like this one. The preceding hour is going to be a Zoom. This will be led by Pastor Harvey and Jackie Lott. And uh, they already have had they already have a married ministry. They're tailoring this to work with our ministry. And uh, I'm excited about it. So you might say, well, wait a minute, I'm, I love watching these lives and, 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 and where am I going to get that? Well, Wednesday is going to be converted. It starts at 8.30, not 9. And what's going to happen on Wednesday is the first hour is going to be a live with the panel. OK, and then the second hour will be classroom discussion where that part won't be live. So if you like these lives, you're still going to get a chance to see them. Um, you'll just have to see them on Wednesdays. OK, between 830 and 930. Praise God. And um, you can also then also join the Zooms then as well and audit a class or even decide to matriculate and take the program completely. Praise the Lord. Saints, we have a few minutes left. Um, I just want to uh, shout out uh, Greater Grace Ministries, which is who you just heard. Pastor Trina Houston leads Greater Grace Ministries. Praise God. We also want to give a shout out to Apostle Ernest who leads the Thoroughbreds, which meet on Thursdays at 7.30. That's the men's uh, Bible group, okay? It's just, a, it's just a, right now he's doing a discussion group. He's not actually involved in an intimate study. And we want to shout out the Heart of Deborah Ministries, which is the woman's ministry, praise God. They are actually going through character studies of the Bible, praise the Lord. So that's the woman's ministry. Of course, you're watching the Bible College, but there's also First Century Christ Church, the church ministry, which holds fellowships, which is a Zoom that starts at one and then goes live on this same website at uh, at two o'clock. And so if you come on at two when it says we'll start shortly, it's probably because we're still in worship or we're still in announcements. But it'll come on between two and two fifteen. We'll be there for that. So we've got the Bible college. We've got a church service. We've got a woman's ministry. We've got a men's ministry. We've got a marriage ministry. Right. And we're also working on um, uh, and then we have great grace ministries, ministry movement as well. And then uh, we have what we're calling Friday night at the theater. Now, Friday night at the theater will not be broadcast for copyright reasons. If you'd like to participate in a Friday night at the theater, you're going to have to connect with us. And so um, if you put in the comments, hey, I'm interested, what's Friday night at the theater? And it's going to be some sort of dramatization that takes place. Um, it's professionally done. It's very, very anointed. Um, it is copyrighted, so we can't just blast it out on the, on the television waves. Um, you know, you would have to connect with us uh, through the through the network that we're going to use to do it with. 
Praise God. So, so many things happening and uh, young adults ministry plan, uh, youth ministry plans. There are big plans. We're going to finish 2021 strong. We do all of this, by the way, by your free will donations. We don't mandate that anybody give us tithes, though we do have some saints that feel of the conviction to tithe and they do so. We don't mandate tithing on anybody in our ministry. We do everything through free will donations. And you see scrolling at the bottom, your ability to donate to the ministry via cash app, uh, we do also have an app. If you download the app, there's a way to donate through the app. It does have a guest donate, so you don't have to give up all your information like the way the app worked before. And if you're like, look, I'm really not anxious to be downloading any new apps to my phone or whatever the situation may be, we also have another way you can donate simply by texting from your smartphone. You can text this, this, this tag, FCCC Ministries, you text it to this toll-free number, it'll respond with a link, and from that link, you'll be able to donate. So we've created a whole bunch of ways that you can give, and guess what? Everything is free. If you can't give, no sweat. Attend. We don't treat you any different if you give. We don't treat you any different if you don't give. We receive freely. We give freely. But we are trying to spread this gospel around the world, and you can help us with that effort. Praise God. We've elapsed our time. It's time to pray out. Father, Lord, in the name of your son, Christ Yeshua, we thank you for the time that we've been doing this uh, Bible, this Sunday school on Monday. And we're looking forward to the movement of the married ministry to become one ministries uh, with Pastor Jackie and Harvey Lott. We're praying for that blessed. I pray, excuse me. We're praying for a blessing over that movement. Rather, we're praying that we be blessed by it, my Lord, and that we all grow in our perfect understanding of your truth. My God, I say perfect understanding because you have provided us a perfect understanding. We just have to come in contact with it. So we may be imperfect, but your understanding is perfect and we want to connect with it. Everything matters to us, Lord. Everything matters. And we're going to seek you with a whole heart, a whole mind, a whole soul. Wherever we failed at this, Lord, please forgive us. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray, and the body of Christ says, Amen. 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 Have a good night, saints. Wait, we got one last comment we're going to put up here. Wait a minute, because we don't want to. Never said. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. New comments. Wait, hang on a second. Hey, get the, let's get some airtime on it. New launch. Oh, Amen. Gosh, Teachers yeah. out there. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Wow. This is our last one, so that's why I'm giving the encore here. Amen from Letitia. Amen from Hetty. Praise God, saints. Have a great night. And hey, my son, he's making his cameo appearance in school too. <laughs> Praise God. Good night, saints.